team and I'm your host today. This event is conducted in hybrid mode with more than 100 participants joining through Zoom. To begin, may I invite Mr. John Kuiper, Head of Corporate Sustainability Asia Pacific of HSBC, Ms. Ellen Ko, Corporate Engagement Manager of CDP, and Ms. Simon Lu, Chief Executive Officer of BC, to stand on the stage for a group photo. Mr. Dan, Ms. Ko, and Ms. Lu, please. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you today, the first in-person event as part of the BEC Carbon Disclosure Program that HSP supported since last year. Given the social restrictions related to pandemic, we will only hold virtual event in 2022. It was actually very refreshing to be able to meet you all face to face today. Um, thank you, Mr. Simon, Simon In, CEO of BEC, and his team, uh, Marilyn, Ringo, Dennis, and Toby, for bringing this idea into reality. And to the CDP team, um, Alan, Dennis, and Bruno, uh, for putting the time and effort in customizing this program for us. Um, the program, which now enters its second year, starts with the belief that each of us play a role in mitigating climate change and realizing a net zero role. We can't manage when we don't measure. Hence, transition to net zero starts from disclosure. A good climate disclosure framework can guide companies not only to disclose, to please their shareholders and regulators, but also to help them and cover risks and opportunities brought out by climate change. Manage these risks, track and benchmark progress, and boost their competitive advantage as they future, uh, future-proof their business. This is why we partner with CDP, which offers a TCFD-aligned disclosure framework and is well recognized by the close to 700 investors globally. The business community in Hong Kong specifically, um, we design this program to help companies overcome the barriers to climate disclosure. Um, be it cost or lack of technical know-how and build more confidence in starting their disclosure. Under this program, 500 Hong Kong-based companies can start using CDP disclosure platform free of charge and receive support from dedicated help desk in addition to build capacity building webinars and exchange experience with other companies, just like we will do today. The results will not be made available to uh, HSBC or public uh, audience, but only to BC to enable further analysis and support to improve the participants' disclosure practice. For a listed company, this program can help them to prepare for the Hong Kong Exchange PCFD reporting requirement in 2025. While for SMEs, this can provide a good opportunity to practice disclosing based on international standards. The same can help them unlock more liquidity through sustainable finance, and more importantly, secure business from conscious buyers who are looking to manage the scope three 
carbon emissions. I, I attend the Walmart Sustainability Annual Conference every year. And it's so impressive actually when I see in the same Zoom, Zoom room, 10,000 company join this kind of summit talking about sustainability. I'm so glad that CLP and SWIRE are all participating in this like, program and uh, addressing the scope three challenges. So this afternoon, we will hear directly from industry practitioners on how climate disclosure has benefited their business and learn how they overcome any challenges in measuring and managing climate impact. Furthermore, I noticed that there are many service companies among the audience. Your participation is key in disseminating the, and, uh, the understanding to wider business and enabling more companies to start the climate disclosure journey. I hope this program will benefit companies from all sizes and sectors and help accelerate climate action in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's unique positioning in connecting China to the world will further amplify the impact of such climate action. I look forward to seeing more companies sign up the BEC Carbon Disclosure Program after the session. And don't forget, sign up before February 23rd. And thank you. I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Invite Mr. Bernie Pounds, head of policy and research BEC, to share with us updates from the BEC Metro Carbon Charter and the Carbon Disclosure Program. Please allow, please. Hey, let me. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for joining uh, on site and online. Uh, I'm Merlin, uh, head of policy and research here at BEC. Uh, I think to set the scene, I, I'll talk about two things here today. One, uh, of course, the carbon disclosure program, which is uh, uh, why today uh, this event is held as part of the component, uh, but also the bigger picture. Actually, the carbon disclosure program is um, one of the charter support project. Uh, under BEC's existing low carbon charter. So I want to give some rationale why, why we are having uh, this event today. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, so one thing, uh, I will start with the, the, the charter first. Uh, the charter is still currently named as the low carbon charter, but it will be renamed soon as the next zero carbon charter. Uh, I want to give a very brief overview on what, what has happened uh, over the past few years. Um, so to recognize the importance of low carbon transition of the business sector, actually uh, in 2017, uh, we have been doing this low carbon uh, Hong Kong initiative as a project. But since then, in 2019, uh, we transitioned and launched the BEC Low Carbon Charter with our aim to encourage and support the businesses in Hong Kong to set and achieve decarbonization targets. Uh, under the cur current uh, charter, there are two pathways for, for companies. Uh, all Hong Kong companies can join. Uh, you can choose as pathway one, which is basically uh, a voluntary uh, declaration or commitment that you will reduce your carbon emissions. And then the pathway to uh, you would pledge to align with the science-based target, but I will speak a little bit more about this later. You can see the transition trend. Um, since 2019, uh, we have 34 uh, starting companies join, uh, Companies started to join us. And until the end of last year, we have uh, 113. Uh, actually the number we, we sort of cut down right now because we are doing rebranding to rename it as the next zero carbon charter. And I will tell a little bit more about this. Uh, I'm not going into detail of this, but uh, I would suggest for companies or, or signatories, you can revisit our last uh, progress report uh, to talk about, uh, to understand uh, like the batch of companies that have reported and also uh, the type of commitment they have made 
I have to say, uh, until right now, the majorities of the companies, they, they select as a pathway one, a pathway two. Sorry, I think uh, that the easier pathway anyway. So uh, they will make voluntary commitment, uh, but most of them, they, they have not pledged to align with the science-based target. And, and that's why uh, some areas that we want to try to tackle more. Uh, under the low carbon charter, uh, we have done a few capacity building activities, not just on that, but a few, uh, we call it charter support projects, uh, including the carbon disclosure program, we will talk about it today. Uh, and we work with international partners, such as the Women Business Coalition to feature Hong Kong, uh, the right Hong Kong case studies on their decarbonization journey and their case studies are, ref uh, are reflected in our website. And we also support the Hong Kong International Airport on building capacity to their business partner. We will talk about scope three, right? So essentially the airport committed to next year by 2050, but it's not just their own emissions, but also their business partners. And business partners, they have various capacity and, and under this program, we try to train them up. Uh, and, and we also have sectoral initiative, such as the power collision that we target our construction site to promote electrification and CO emission construction means. So these are some of the activities uh, uh, under our low carbon charter. Um, so why we are going to rename uh, is a nutshell that we are trying to say because the charter, uh, it was launched in 2019, but then the Hong Kong government released the uh, Climate Action Plan 2050 in 2021. And also more companies are making next year pledges um, basically after 2019. There are a couple of guidelines released, um, including from the SBTI, Hong Kong Exchange, ISO standard, and also the UN. And they all try, all try to talk about what it means for next year uh, for the corporate sector. So essentially the low carbon charter, I mean, for companies, if you want to be ambitious, you cannot be just low carbon. We are talking about how you actually transition to next year. And that's also the reason why um, the BEC is trying to raise the bar and, and, and try to make the charter more let's say ambitious, but at the same time, more inclusive to support our uh, business community in Hong Kong. Uh, this is just theory of change. I'm not going into detail, but basically we want to align with the Hong Kong government's uh, climate neutrality plan by 2050. And also, um, as some of us may know, the, the, the global globally is asking to halve emissions by 2030, while the Hong Kong government has a 2030 interim target. So from the business partner, uh, business sector, we want to mobilize them to take the right actions to accelerate this interim target together. Um, under the ch new charter, uh, the, the rebranded next zero carbon charter, there are four things that we would do. Uh, it may be similar to uh, some of us who, who are familiar with the low carbon charter. You can understand that it's more about commitment, but we want to structure it uh, in a way that we ask for company to sign for uh, sign back the form and do account uh, accountability by the end of the year. And in between that, we will provide capacity buildings, um, including uh, SBDI, what it means, and also some of the sector specific uh, components. And we will also try to build a bigger community to try to influence back the government policies. So this uh, we call it 4A uh, under also our cooperation with the Women Business Coalition to try to shape the charter to be more supportive to our business partners. Um, this The brief is like this. Um, so we try to be more ambitious in asking companies at the very minimum basis, if you want to commit to the new charter, at least you need to let us know your target. It doesn't need to be 50% but at least it needs to be the SMART criteria, which is also aligned with the Hong Kong Exchange recommendation in the next year guidelines. And then for the more ambitious one, we ask the minimum that you try to align your target with the science-based 1.5 degree pathway. Um, and basically we raise the bar by doing this. And we also hope after companies signing up to the uh, easier category in a few years time, they will be raising up their ambition to set up near-term target. That's our rationale in, in the uh, next zero carbon charter. Uh, that connects back to what we talk about today. We will still be asking companies to do annual uh, sharing 
or disclosure to us uh, using our BEC tracking form. But at the same time, because of this collaboration, we will enable some of the companies who decide to disclose YCDP and we will capture some of the data and try to consolidate together as a, our progress report in the next zero carbon charter. Uh, for that, I will skip the, the timeline, uh, but we will be launching this very soon and recruiting uh, again our signatories in uh, the time frame of March and April. And we will uh, do also a launch event in June. Uh, please stay tuned on this. Uh, then it comes back to, to the carbon disclosure program today. Um, uh, I'm sure our, our uh, CDP and also business pan uh, our panel will talk more about this. So I will try to be brief on this. Um, basically, um, under the support of HSBC, we will provide uh, opportunities to ask uh, our signatory corporate members and also other business partners to try to sign up to the CDP platform if they wish to. Uh, to to start and try to see uh, try to start their climate disclosure journey. So basically, it's a cost free opportunity for those who haven't started or those who are not requested by investor. Um, many of you may ask, like, what are the benefits or what are the actually the things that we can get? Uh, I think I can summarize in three point. Indirectly, I think by uh, joining this, you will be providing uh, data for BEC to consolidate and, and analyze to find the capacity building needs for us to organize the right activities for you. And that's the indirect side. And for the direct side, if you complete your um, questionnaire before end of July, you actually will receive uh, direct feedback uh, also from CDP as well. Uh, which would provide this peer benchmarking for the similar type of company or in other regions, how your companies are in general doing. And of course, uh, as part of the project, we would provide direct support uh, for those of you who come, to an, uh, who come to us and ask questions. And in the end, uh, as I mentioned, it's free for those who, who, who first time disclose or actually you are not uh, like requested by investor already. That's a timeline. Uh, I will I will leave it for um, Alim to to elaborate about this program. But uh, basically, uh, I want to spend two minutes to talk about what happened last year because it's a three year program, uh, and we have over a hundred signatory. So last time, the first time we started by asking signatory, are you willing to to join this or disclose via this platform? So when we asked, uh, forty companies uh, decided to say yes. <laughs> And we capture some of the data uh, in this uh, impact report. And, and you can see like uh, if you are, I have to say our program is, is more like signatory engagement program. But if you are the supply chain, it's different relationship. So essentially, you can see it here for the supply chain, for the companies who request them to answer, you can see that maybe 60 to 70% of the companies are actually are responding to, to the re request to fill in the CTP platform. Um, so for, for our signatory, we can see that for those who are currently disclosing, they are quite um, uh, advanced in a, say, in, in a sense that you can see 90% of them actually cover the scope one and 95% already cover scope two emissions. Uh, and you can see those great areas are CTP average. So in general, uh, it's higher. And this graph uh, for the impact report is the same uh, that you can see some of the areas of scope three that are mostly uh, identified or like focused by the others. And for example, business travel and this uh, procurement thing, they are the most concerned by our business partners. So for the details, actually uh, we will discuss this in our impact report. Uh, but I'm trying just to show a few slides that uh, by participating this, you, how your data will be analyzed and actually feedback anonymously uh, to our audience and to our business, uh, uh, to our uh, charter signatory as a whole. Um, and also in the system, uh, you are allowed to fill in different targets. You have general target, uh, absolute 
or like an intensity target. You can also have more structure scope one, two, three targets. And also you can have this SBTI target as a whole. And we also capture this uh, in our report. Um, I think I would not have enough time to go through them one by one. Let me just try to move to the last two slides here. Uh, one thing that we do is in, in this program, we we'll capture the collaboration or action opportunities that are mostly reflected by our signatories or, or, or companies who sign up to the program. For example, as shown here, like including energy reduction, logistic arrangement. And based on that, we will create a specific um, capacity building event as, as, as well as those like charter project ideas that we mentioned earlier. And, and that's one of the biggest impact, I would say, uh, to drive us to create more meaningful things that most of you would like to see next. And, and that's one, one thing that I want to mention here. Uh, and lastly, uh, coming back to this, again, um, if you are interested in this program, you can already sign up your interest now in our website. Uh, the QR codes are here, including uh, the description of the program, as well as like, if you are already interested in signing up, you can just uh, sign up to, I think it's a Microsoft form, fill in some details and our colleagues will be in touch with you. Uh, with that, I think I, I gave a general uh, summary why we are here today and, and have this discussion and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Very wise with Kelly Lee onto the stage. With Lee comes from the lifting division of the Home Exchange of the Fifth Limited and is a senior vice president of quality and credit service for the day. She will give us a review and outlook how we relate to the closure of this company in Hong Kong. With Lee, please. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you BEC and also CDP with the support of HSBC for having me here today to talk about and share with you all our observations of our company's um, our latest ESG practices, as well as what we see are the key priorities coming forward. So um, just a very quick recap on the um, key developments around climate related disclosures. I think since the introduction and the publication of TCFB's recommendations back in 2017, um, there's obviously an increasing demand um, from the investor cycle and also from the um, all these kinds of stakeholders, corporates, in, uh, for more consistent and comparable information uh, around climate disclosures. And so um, in back in 2021, um, we have the establishment of the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which um as which is established with an objective to set up a global baseline for sustainability information. And the ISSB has published their exposure drafts for climate and also general sustainability disclosures um, back in March last year. And it is expected that all these standards will be finalized uh, towards the end of uh, Q2 this year. And closer to home, uh, we have the establishment of the cross-agency steering group, um, which comprise of all the financial regulators in Hong Kong, uh, with a view to have a coordinated policy um, development um, towards the green and sustainable uh, hub for the Hong Kong development. And one of the objectives set by the cross-agency steering group is to have mandatory TCFD-aligned climate disclosures by 2025. So um, HKEX as a member of this uh, steering group is obviously working towards this deadline. And um, as mentioned by Merlin just now, uh, we also have the government's carbon neutrality target by 2050 and also the publication of the Hong Kong Climate Action Plan. So obviously the trend is towards decarbonization and also more enhanced climate disclosures. So what we have done in the past, well, it's some problem with that. Okay, since um, the introduction of our voluntary ESG uh, framework back in 2013, um, we have seen a lot of good progress in terms of our company's uh, performance in the ESG practices. Starting from 2016, we mandate all listed companies in Hong Kong to produce uh, an ESG report on an annual basis. And over the past years, we have been gradually 
enhancing and upgrading our ESG requirements. And one of the most um, significant uh, enhancements that we have introduced was back in uh, July 2020, when we uh, placed a lot of uh, highlights and focus on ESG governance, as well as climate disclosures, which I will go into more details later. And also one of the um, more recent development is that we have aligned the publication deadline for all the ESG reports together with the annual reports. And this will um, cover all the ESG reports for the financial year 2022. And um, apart, as a regulator, we do see that um, the disclosures is just an articulation of the company's commitment towards um, ESG and also how they manage and mitigate their ESG, uh, climate risk, including uh, and other ESG risk. So um, we do want to urge our companies to really take into account all these ESG considerations and how to integrate all these into their business operations. So we do see um, market engagement and capacity building a very, playing a very important role in terms of enhancing the whole ESG quality uh, within our market. So in the past years, we have spent a lot of effort in terms of providing different types of guidance or in a form of e-trainings, webinars, published guidance for different target audience of our listed companies in order to help them to facilitate their compliance and also um, uh, improving their ESG practices. So one of the um, important exercise that we regularly conduct is the review of our issuers ESG practices. We will sample uh, review about 400 ESG reports and, um, and our latest findings have been published last year in November. I think this exercise is important in twofold. Firstly, is, is it helps us to understand where our issuers are and also uh, to help us identify the improvement areas and provide the necessary guidance to our companies. Secondly, um, this also enables and also inform our future ESG policy for, uh, direction. So um, our last review focused on the um, enhancement that we introduced back in 2020. And we, uh, we categorize all these findings into four key buckets. The first bucket is on the ESG board governance. And the, um, one of the key focus of the 2020 enhancements was on um, the governance and also the oversight of ESG matters. And we do see that um, there's a very significant improvement in terms of um, our company's performance over these. And you'll see very high compliance rate and a vast majority of our companies uh, have very detailed disclosures around um, how the board involvement and also how they overs oversee um, and manage all the um, ESG issues within the company. This include um, disclosures around the structure and also the different roles and duties. But one area that we identified as a room for improvement is around the uh, review of ESG targets. Uh, we see that a lot of our companies did disclose their ESG targets. However, only less than half of them disclosed whether they, the board involved in the review of the progress and also what's the, the results. So um, one tip for our companies is that is firstly, is a breach of listing rules if you omit such disclosure in your ESG report. And secondly, I think, as I said, uh, the whole intention of introducing this requirement is that we want the company to evaluate the effectiveness of the ESG measures in place. And this exactly how, as how the uh, review of progress um, of your ESG targets can help you. So yeah, some tips uh, in terms of the disclosure and also the, what the practices can be. And I think one of the very important thing is that uh, when you review your targets, uh, some we, we understand well, through our engagement with our companies, some company, companies will say, oh, it may be very embarrassing if I say, oh, I can't re achieve that target. So what happened to us? I think ex that's exactly that what we want you to do by reviewing your uh, reviewing your progress. You can see whether the measures or the actions in place or your policies in place are efficient or effective. So we want you to do um, analyze the reasons or rationale behind of the results if you are not um, able to meet your targets. And then you need to evaluate whether, whether any adjustments is needed in terms of your target set or even in terms of your policies or the measures in place. 
On the second bucket, the climate change, in the um, uh, 2020 enhancements, we um, uh, introduced uh, uh, several new requirements. Firstly, we asked our issuers to uh, report on the significant climate change um, issues that may impact or have impacted our issuers, and also what steps or um, what actions will be taken in, to mitigate those risks. And also we require the scope one and scope two emissions, and also we also require target setting for set, set certain environmental targets. Uh, although all these disclosures are only on a comply or explain basis, it's really encouraging to see that uh, over 85% of our issuers chose to make disclosures on all these new climate disclosures. This uh, reinforce our direction and um, also re uh, demonstrate that our issuers do acknowledge the importance of climate change issues to their business and to their operations. We um, also go a, a step a, a, a bit further in terms of looking on other voluntary climate related disclosures that are made by our companies. We look at three aspects, um, whether um, they follow the TCFD recommendations in terms of the disclosure. We found that over one fifth of our issuers do make uh, uh, reference to the TCFD recommendations or they try to structure the disclosures um, in accordance with the four pillars of the TCFD recommendations. And another important finding that we have is that in terms of scope three emissions, Although it's not our requirement for companies to report on scope three emissions right now, we, um, it's very encouraging to see that um, around one third of our issuers already started um, to put a consideration on making voluntary disclosures on this scope three emissions. Although um, uh, they're not looking at every single category along the whole value chain, but it's a good start that they tried, they started to put their mind into this aspect. And uh, I think very consistent with uh, what Merlin just mentioned. Most um, the common uh, category that being reported on is on business travel, which we believe that is because of the availability of data, which will be easier in terms um, to obtain those data within the um, own organization. And on the adoption of scenario analysis, we are uh, less than 5% of our companies um, have adopted a climate related scenario analysis in um, evaluating their uh, climate resilience in their ESG reports. And uh, we do notice that um, those uh, issuers who, who started reporting this is uh, generally at a more advanced stage in terms of the climate reporting journey. So, um, while we look at scope three and also scenario analysis, um, obviously all these are uh, identified as more challenging items, not only limited to Hong Kong listed companies, but also all the corporates around the world. So we do recognize that these are the more challenging uh, items for, um, for our companies. And uh, we also know that all these are required under the new ISSB standards, um, at least in the uh, exposure draft currently. So we, all these are not um, something that can be reported on within a day. So we do want our companies to start thinking and planning ahead uh, to prepare for these upcoming uh, reporting on scope three and also scenario analysis. And here are some um, tips on this. And um, uh, we have our guidance on climate disclosures on our HKEX website, which sets out some um, structured way to help companies to start with their own scenario analysis. So I do urge you to have a look at it. And on the remaining two buckets, I think I'll just quickly go through it. Um, on the social issue side, uh, apart from upgrading all the disclosure obligations to comply or explain, we also introduced two new KPIs around um, identification of supply chain risks and also on practices to encourage green procurement. We do uh, recognize that the supply chain is important um, along the uh, for in terms of the company's decarbonization journey, especially when you need to start to report on your scope three. So. Um, we do encourage uh, companies to um, also focus on, on these uh, supply chain um, new KPIs. 
And on the reporting practices, um, uh, we have four key principles um, set out in our ESG rules uh, to help companies um, to prepare a meaningful and concise ESG reports. And uh, I think most of our companies do um, follow all these reporting principles in terms of um, uh, preparing the reports. And um, as I said, one of the latest uh, requirements that we introduced is the alignment of publication timeline of ESG reports and annual reports. And um, for those who are preparing for the 2022 ESG reports, do remember and aware of this new requirement. In terms of the way forward, as I said, um, once the, uh, I think um, the, uh, all the regulators around the world are looking at the ISSB finalization of the new standards. And um, we are also looking to launch a consultation this year to further enhance our ESG requirements, and particularly focusing on the climate disclosures on how we can integrate the ISSB climate requirements into our own framework. And as I said, scenario analysis, scope three, and some matrices, um, cross-industry matrices, all these will be um, new to our issuers, but uh, and we do encourage our companies to start getting yourself familiar with all these concepts in order to prepare the enhanced um, requirements. And last but not least, um, for um, on our market education uh, or capacity building side, we have launched a ESG Academy, which is a one-stop platform centralizing all the exchanges, um, uh, exchanges guidance materials, and also all our trainings here all in one place so that our companies and also the relevant stakeholders, whoever are interested in this topic can have a look. And uh, on this, I will particularly highlight one section, which is called ESG in practice, where we have highlighted our regulatory focuses, and also we have extracted some um, issuers' good practices on this page to encourage peer learning um, from each other. And so um, that's the end of my presentation, and I do hope you guys have a very fruitful discussion afterwards. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Ellen Ford, Corporate Engagement Manager at CDP for sharing with us together to organize several CDP Climate Data Analysis 2022. Please please. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for, for the um, opening remarks and also Merlin's and Kelly's introduction. Uh, and also very insightful presentation. My name is Ellen Park. I'm a corporate engagement manager at CDP, and I uh, manage corporate disclosure and supply chain program uh, in Hong Kong, as well as the wider greater China region. So in the next 15 minutes, I'll try to address three key questions. One, um, the key trends that we identified using uh, last year's data we collect from over 188 uh, companies in Hong Kong. Second, what are the benefits of disclosing the CDP? And lastly, how can you participate if you haven't already done so? So for those of you who are not familiar with CDP, we are an NGO that runs the global uh, environmental disclosure platform. Today, we host um, the most comprehensive self-reported environmental data in the world. And how we work is that every year, we will issue requests to private and public uh, listed companies, as well as suppliers um, and also other companies. And we issue these data requests on behalf of our requesting authorities. This includes over 680 capital market signatories, um, as well as over 280 uh, large purchasing organizations worldwide as well as local partners like BEC. We issue this request, suppliers got this request, and then they can log on to our CDP platform and start disclosing their climate change, water, and or forest data. So today we're going to focus on climate change question now. All the collected data will then be feedback to our requesting authorities that I mentioned just now. 
but not only those parties can uh, get ahead of this data. CDP also help companies to reach and engage um, with international stakeholders. For example, on the right, um, we also share data with the civil society. For example, initiatives like SVTI and RE100 also get data through CDP platform. And on the left, uh, you can see international uh, indices, ratings, they're also using our data to evaluate companies' performance. Now, globally, we are seeing a, a surge in disclosure numbers. So uh, last year, we have over 18,700 companies disclosed to us. It's a record-breaking year, but to be honest, it has been a record-breaking year for a while. Um, but the key point I want to highlight here is especially after 2018, you are seeing a exponential growth of disclosure numbers. And one of the reasons why is that in 2018, CDP um, questionnaires are aligned with TCFD. And what IFRS and uh, CDP has announced is that in 2024, um, the ISSB climate standard will be incorporated into CDP existing questionnaire. It means if companies continue to disclose with CDP, your disclosure will be aligned with ISSB. And this trend is not only happening in the West. Um, when we look at APEC data, last year we have over 6,000 companies disclosed to us, um, and which is a 37% increase. And if you look at Hong Kong disclosure, uh, we have 188 companies, which is a 52% increase, year on year increase. Um, so it's over the APEC average. And it's ranked, um, is the sixth largest market by climate disclosure number. So the message here is really start disclosing and ride on, ride on this wave. Now the pathway to net zero is a marathon. So CDP is here to help tracking the pathways, guiding companies to net zero, by incentivizing best practice and also hold companies accountable for progress. We understand that companies from different backgrounds are at different stage um, of the sustainability journey, but CDP really welcomes all to start disclosing as soon as possible, and then we can help you to progress along the journey. Next, um, we are going to see in this three category um, from you know, building foundation, build capacity and to improve performance, how Hong Kong companies are actually performing under this um, milestone. As mentioned before, last year we have 188 companies disclosed to us, of which 36 received a public score. Um, so these are companies that are requested by the capital markets, um, mostly listed companies with large market cap, we can see the majority of companies are um, scored with the Bs and the Cs. So that means the management and awareness uh, level. So what awareness band means is that these companies uh, have done initial assessments and screenings, but not necessarily taken any action to address these climate issues. And for those who are on management band, Bs, it means that they have provided evidence to CDP of climate actions associated with good environmental practice. As for uh, ACE, they are on the leadership ban, and I have to highlight here that in Hong Kong last year, we have three outstanding uh, companies who achieved A-, minus, and they are CLP, New World Development, and Swai Pacific. Um, so these companies have formulated and implemented strategies to mitigate and capitalize climate-related risk and opportunity. Not only, not only that, they also have verified greenhouse gas emissions and also have proved that they have implemented emissions reduction initiatives and strategies to reach the company-wide targets. And on the right, oh, sorry, on the left, um, I would also want to highlight that although 188 companies have started disclosing, the response rate is 43%. It means uh, there are still 248 companies who have re received requests from either the either investors or from overseas customers, but refused to disclose. So in 2023, we'll be working with BEC with support from HSBC 
and try to improve the disclosure rates as well as uh, helping more SMEs and companies to start disclosing. As we mentioned in the beginning, we cannot manage what you don't measure. So a robust emission inventory with third party verification is the bedrock of the net zero journey and also the foundation of setting uh, robust targets. So what we found from uh, Hong Kong companies' disclosure is that almost 80% of the reporting companies have no emissions verification at all. So this is a very clear message sent to everyone that uh, if you're looking for um, the first step, of course, after you decided to disclose the CDP, the next one will be try to at least verify your scope one and two emissions. And we can see a lot of these companies, there are 144 who report that they have no um, verification in place. A lot of these are suppliers. And because of all the regulations and laws uh, passed in the EU and North America, we know that it will cause a global impact. And for suppliers or companies that have uh, these business ties with these overseas companies, they will be asked to provide emissions data. So this is not only for the environment, but also crucial for Hong Kong companies to stay competitive. Now, target setting provides directions uh, and structure to environmental strategy. So we also did an analysis um, on target setting and found that 57% of the Hong Kong companies who disclosed so that they have at least one emissions target. So this can be intensity targets, absolute targets, science-based targets. Some companies might have more than one targets, but 57% of them said they have at least one. But also our findings tell us that there are less than 10% of these companies have set net zero targets. So we can see the need of more targets uh, that is aligned with 1.5 degree needs to be set so that we can have global emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050 to avoid the most dangerous and irreversible effects to climate change. Climate transition plan, how CDP see it is that it's a vital tool to show or demonstrate to uh, capital markets and stakeholders that a company is committed to achieving a 1.5 degree pathway. And the company business model will still be uh, relevant, which means profitable. So having a credible climate transition plan uh, is seen as leading climate action or climate practice, the CDP. So what we did here is CDP identified 21 key indicators across our climate change questionnaire and evaluate if a company has disclosed sufficient and credible transition plan information um, in 2022. So these samples are taken from a Hong Kong companies and most of them, 123 of them, um, disclosed less than disclosed to less than seven indicators. 47 of them disclosed to some of the indicators, 16 of them disclosed to many of the indicators, but no companies disclosed to all 21 key indicators. Transition plan is also a key focus of CDP. Um, it's included in our 2025 strategy, so it will maintain us a strong focus for CDP. Um, if you're interested in knowing more, we have also announced or published a report uh, last week on transition plan, and we have a technical notes on transition plan as well. So uh, you're welcome to um, take a look on those on our website. Now, just to recap uh, on my presentation, the benefits of disclosing through CDP. Um, I'm sure that all of you have heard a lot about, you know, what's happening around the world. There's a lot of... Um, um, floods, um, um, wildfires and whatnot. So I'm not here to remind you um, the environmental um, or climate, how serious climate um, change is, but rather I'm telling you there's a business case behind disclosing to CDP. So I won't repeat myself, but here are some key bullet points um, that I think all companies can be benefit from disclosing their environmental data. I will wrap my presentation with this disclosure timeline. Um, as Merlin mentioned, 
if you haven't started disclosing or you're willing to disclose in 2023, please reach out to us or fill in the um, expression of interest form, which we are closing on the 23rd of February. And then our disclosure cycle, as in the platform, will open in uh, mid-April. Um, companies will have uh, April until July to complete and submit their uh, responses online. Um, and that's my 15 minutes. So it's in my title job position that I am corporate I do corporate engagement. So um, if you have any questions or anything, just please uh, come to me and say hi. Uh, I would love to uh, meet all of you. And I will see you later in the break and in the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Now let's move on to our first panel discussion about corporate safety experience and supply chain engagement. That involves Mr. Herbert Roth, Director of Member Engagement and Sustainability League, Hong Kong Institute of Certified Public Content, to moderate the panel discussion and each of our panelists. Online participants can type their questions in the QA box, and I'll moderate the array of questions to the guests after the panel discussion. Mr. Young, over to you, please. Thank you. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this panel, especially on the Valentine's Day. Uh, on the panel today, we have uh, Jester Chen, uh, Senior Manager, ESG from Tangas. Yeah. So uh, to begin our discussion, uh, I would like to start asking uh, when did your company start to participate in the CDP and also what's the motivation behind? Um, uh, uh, yeah, please. Uh, okay, so um, interestingly, Swire started reporting to CDP back in 2005. Uh, and actually issued our first sustainability report in 2007. So actually CDP predated our um, sustainability reporting efforts at a, at a group level. Um, what motivated it? Well, hard for me to say, I wasn't there at the time. Um, but what I would say is that I think what motivates us to continue to, to respond to CDP, it's kind of been touched on by a lot of the presentations already. So one is it allows us to, to benchmark our performance against our peers. So very interesting to see the fact that only three companies made, uh, got the A minus score and no one got the A yet. So there's still room for us to improve there. Um, uh, another one is, is that it allows us to more effectively engage with um, our investors and our providers of capital because many, as demonstrated by uh, LM's presentation, many um, uh, financial institutions, uh, rating agencies, uh, uh, um, insurance companies are actually uh, uh, incorporating um, CDP analysis within their um, evaluation of the company and its value uh, and its evaluation of the the overall performance, but also the value valuation of the company. So that's also another key driver. And I guess ultimately the other is is that it allows us to see upcoming and future trends. Uh, that are coming out. So as CDP is is adding more and more to the questionnaire, which they seem to do every year, um, then uh, it allows us to be able to see uh, what the, the change in the market is, what the change in expectations from the market is, and what kind of things we need to be uh, putting in place. Because I think one of the, it's been touched on before that this is a journey and, you know, you're, you're not, very few companies um, uh, go from, you know, uh, a, a, an F to, to a, a, an A within the space of a short period of time. It takes a while to put in place all of the systems and processes, data to get things going. And so actually uh, using CDP as uh, uh, for, for fortune telling, for want of a better word, it, 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 it can be valuable in that sense. Jessica? Hey, um, hi, I'm Jessica from MTL. Uh, for MTL, I think, uh, well, I, I don't know, well, well, the exact years that we joined CDP, but then I, I would say it's over 10 years. Uh, 
joint CP disclosing our climate related information. Um, I think uh, most of the reasons have been <laughs> you know, um, told by um, Mark uh, why we joining CP were pretty much similar. But I can add one more point is that uh, just, um, I think back to three or four years, uh, we found our society report is very long, over 200 pages. And um, there's quite, actually quite a lot of information that's uh, quite repetitive and would like to streamline the report. And then if we work to solve CVP and then we can, you know, streamline all those climate related information uh, actually in our uh, society report, um, we like, uh, just report back to the questionnaire and because it's publicly available. So that's one more, you know, reason that uh, we will continue to support CVPs. Um, Tom gets starts reporting because uh, we see that as an energy utility company, there is a need for us to transit to a cleaner, to the profession of cleaner fuels. So, and we also want to be an excellent student when it comes to disclosure, but being an excellent student, you need a, you need a scorecard. So CEP in terms of climate change disclosure and the requirements, it happens to be the most comprehensive and forward looking uh, benchmarking or, or, or the fact sheet. So, Basically, we, we disclose because we want to be the, the excellent student in the room. So just to sort of build up yeah. that, I think for, for the companies that aren't currently mm -hmm. disclosing to CDP, I think the motivators might be slightly different. Mm -hmm. And for them, what I would say is, is that the way that the CDP questionnaire is, is structured and broken down gives you a really strong guide around how you should be building your, your sustainability strategy and your strategy around whether it's climate or water or, or, or forestry in relation to the other questionnaires. So, so actually that process around sort of like, you know, um, governance structures, what are your governance structures that you have in place? How is information flowing up and down throughout the organization? How does the board of oversight over uh, climate change, the, the risk strategy, looking at how uh, climate change is built into your enterprise risk management framework, uh, how you, you assess climate risk, uh, how you assess opportunity, and then obviously the data and the targets, you know, all of this flows very nicely and should provide an, a neat guide for, for companies in relation to their uh, first uh, forays into uh, CDP disclosure. Thank you. So I think it's a learning process after all. Yes. And then uh, I think everyone here is interested to know with a long reporting history and good CPD score, uh, I'd like to ask uh, what are the uh, tips you want to share with the company that who just started to uh, uh, on their reporting process? Uh, maybe Jessica? Yeah, I, I think for us, uh, well, the, um, the first tips is uh, to get the data available first, because uh, if you look at the CVP question, apart from the description about the governance structure and your strategies and so on, we do need to have some certain uh, data Disclose in its sort of CPD, uh, you know, um, disclose to pass on. So, well, there are lots of climate related data that we need to, um, you know, disclose, like the uh, energy consumption, energy usage, and renewable energy, and scope one emission as well. So, data would be one of the, you know, um, key areas that I, I would suggest you have a look before you go to the CPD, CPD you know, disclose job. Yeah, I don't want to sound overly repetitive, <laughs> but, um, you know, or sound like a politician, but data, data, data is essentially what you need to be focusing on. And so uh, one of the challenges that we have as a diversified conglomerate with businesses across multiple sectors is standardization of the data. So we have gone through a, a, a thorough process to actually set up data protocols to make sure that each of our individual businesses are calculating um, the data in the right way and in the same way that the estimation methodologies if needed, is standardized, um, and that the scoping and boundary setting uh, is standardized across the group. So for me, that is the key step because uh, that allows you to then establish a solid uh, baseline year, and then that facilitates you with your ability to set in a target. The idea of setting a target before you have a, a solid baseline year is, is a very bad idea. Um, and, and so, yeah, uh, sort out your data, get that standardized. That was the key first step. Yeah, I totally agree with you because uh, apart from Hong Kong, because we have operations in you know, uh, different countries. So when we do the reporting, especially carbon, uh, we, we have to standardize all our you know, interpretation of how we you know, uh, you know, um, 
um, describe that data source and what kinds of data we are expecting from different hubs. And so that is a very important, uh, you know, step to align all the reporting, you know, requirements among our school as well. Yes, apart from the data collection and reporting, I think it is also important to choose the right model when you do the forecast or when you do the assessments. Because for like town gas, you know, uh, as an energy company, there are numerous uh, energy projection models when it comes to like the upcoming 10 or 20 years. And you have to choose which one is right for you. Uh, for example, if we, want, if we want to disclose, like last year, we disclosed the financial impacts uh, for the upcoming 30 years uh, for town gas or, or for, for the uh, natural gas business that we have. Uh, we had quite spent quite some time to choose the right model to convince our senior management that this is the right projection case for town gas business in the mainland China and in Hong Kong. Because like in the whole world, there are so many models that you could use, but getting the right one makes you have much more confident in disclosing the financial uh, data. Just to, just to add one, one last thing on top of the data, the, the other is, is effective recruitment. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the A minus score that we have there is, is a result of having top quality talent within the sustainability team at Swire. We've been with, I'm very blessed to have an outstanding team that actually helps pull together the, the report and the information and that is key. And if, if you, it's not just from the point of view of your staff, but also identification of, of top quality consultants who can actually help. Um, and so uh, that for me is, is a key thing. So also getting good talent in, identifying good consultancies that can help and also engaging with LM and, uh, at, at CDP mm -hmm. as well, who um, provides invaluable uh, support and guidance. So uh, those would be key recommendations for starters. Thank you. So apart from the data and talent, so I'd like to know uh, what kind of challenges that you have mm -hmm. encountered during your reporting process and how you resolve it? I think, uh, maybe I start first. But I think uh, apart from CDP, there are a lot of different indices that have different kind of scorecards or different kind of standards. So the most challenging, challenging part for us is how to get the massive data that is needed for these indices and persuade, persuade other departments or data owners who provide the data that is really needed. A lot of times these data, maybe they have different definitions or different scopes, which is tedious for those data owners to provide, like for standard A, I have this set of data, for standard B, I need to provide and recalculate another set of data. So what our department or what my team does is that we try to, to find out the common parts or to find, to find out the different parts of different indices. For example, when it comes to uh, climate data, uh, we need to, just like the other two speakers has mentioned, we need to set the tone and set the ground and tell them, okay, this is the standard for town gas. And we need, or we have to disclose like this. So, so as to minimize the kind of time and effort that they need to spend on working on the same set of data, but different uh, standards that will be very tedious for both our department and other departments. If, if we want to, at one hand, disclose very comprehensively, but at the same time, disclose a very uh, correct, in, in a very correct manner, or the data integrity, I mean, is, is, is a hard part that needs somebody in the company or needs somebody from the consultancy to help you to organize those kind of data. Yeah, I, I, I really applaud, applaud CDP for actually uh, working on this alignment of, of, of frameworks because that is, is so important. I mean, I have a team of, of uh, eight people working on sustainability at the head office level. I'd say half of them are spending half of their time a year just on disclosure. Um, and so actually, the more alignment that we can have within these international frameworks, uh, the better. Um, I think timing is also a, a, a tricky one as far as a challenge. All of the, the rating agencies are, uh, frustratingly have the same timeline as far as uh, when, when we need to report. So uh, essentially no one from my team is getting any holiday between now and probably July um, in relation so we can actually complete all of the submissions in time. So I think that, you know, those are, are challenges. For us, some of the other additional ones are probably relatively unique uh, to Swire in that because we're such a diversified business, um, depending on the different rating agency, we are different sectors, depending on the classification model that they apply. So for 
Hang Seng, we're a conglomerate for DGSI, we're a real estate company. For CDP, we're a beverage company. So actually being able to consistently uh, report across, uh, across that can be quite a, a tricky one. Um, in relation to the challenges for improvement of our existing score, um, uh, one is uh, at the, there is a, to score high on renewable energy, you have to be, uh, I think it's over 30% of, of, of your energy supply needs to be coming from renewable sources. Um, CRP uh, on, on the panel, but uh, uh, currently the Hong Kong plan is, is I think, 5%. Um, so, so that's going to be quite challenging uh, as far as hitting that 30% threshold for Hong Kong, let alone um, for, for mainland China, again, where the, at the moment there isn't a, a centralized energy procurement platforms, which it makes it easier in the Europe and North American continent. So that's a challenging area. SBT, um, currently two of our major um, divisions, so Swire Properties and Swire Coca-Cola of SBTs aligned with the 1.5 degree pathway, but having one as a conglomerate is, is according to SBTI, virtually impossible. Um, and yet we lose points for not having one uh, at, at a group level. So, so there are challenges um, in relation to that as well. But um, for the most part, I think um, it's just timing, you know, focus on getting the, the building blocks in place and then build off that with your scenario analysis and all of the elements that um, was talked about earlier in relation to the stock exchange requirements. If, if you're fully in compliance with the Hong Kong stock exchange rules, you should be getting a seat. Well, um, I think it was, um, yeah, um, well, for, for, for the reporting um, standard, yes, I agree that uh, it's there a lot of uh, different agency are having different requirements. And, uh, well, of course, we spend quite a lot of time to, you know, try to put the answer from different uh, hubs and also our business unit to reply for that uh, those kinds of uh, questionnaires. So it's quite time consuming. I think for you know um, small scale you know company, um, I would say you can uh, try to prioritize your resources in instead of you know doing everything at one time. And even for us, I, I like NTLs, uh, we have to prioritize. Even for climate uh, disclosure, we have done already. I think um, quite a long time ago, and um, because there's so many new requirements coming out, like the you know as we hear the um, scope three emissions accounting and also net zero and scenario analysis, we have to prioritize our resources. We don't have so many people in our team. <laughs> yeah, we, we, so that's why we have to prioritize. Yes. Yeah. I think that's important for, you know, as for any medium-sized company. And at times, I think it is important to allow time for yourself yeah. to catch up with the highest standard because it really takes time. For example, uh, last year, uh, we have persuaded our management to do the ESG link uh, compensation. It actually did, did this project scope, uh, it took us about half a year to persuade the management because you know there are a lot of different details inside the proposal. And of course, sometimes there might be some obstacles from different part of the stakeholders, but then it really uh, prioritized like what we just mentioned. Uh, what you, you have to know, which part uh, you need to do first and what is the next. Maybe set up a plan for upcoming, upcoming three to five years will help you to, to make sure that you are not too panicked to catch up with the latest uh, requirements. And of course, CDP, just now we mentioned is already one of the most comprehensive ones. So if you get every box ticked in CDP, I guess you are pretty much already have done all the things you need to do. Yeah, I, th I think that um, prioritize is, is a re really good suggestion. So, for example, um, uh, what you just talked about there, that's, that's huge, right? Linking it that ESG into compensation. Um, we're not quite there yet. Um, and that's a conversation that I um, can't say I'm necessarily looking forward to having, but uh, it's a, a conversation that definitely needs to be had at some point. But what we've done is we, so we initially prioritized um, uh, from a scenario analysis, looking at physical risks. Um, that was, to us, that was a, an, an easier thing to do rather than transition risk, because we're such a diversified business that the, the nature of the transition risks vary significantly from sector to sector. Uh, so we, we started with the physical risk piece. Uh, we, we published that last year. 
this year we're, we'll be working on the, the transitional waste piece. Um, we uh, uh, also decided to focus on internal carbon pricing. Um, and this year we are implementing internal carbon pricing within uh, three of our uh, major businesses that account for pushing 90% of our scope one, scope two emissions. And so uh, essentially uh, a hybrid model where there's uh, an actual carbon fee, real money that's driving it, current investment in decarbonization activities, as well as a shadow price to actually drive future investments um, uh, uh, within the group around um, low carbon uh, technology, low carbon businesses. And so we prioritize that because that was an easier conversation to have uh, internally. Uh, and, and yes, that ultimately that's also a conversation that will need to be had at some point. Thank you. Sounds like a lot to do in order to get a good score. I hope uh, you've got some time to rest. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say, yeah, do, do try to get a, well, uh, well, I think you have to do something that's, uh, you know, um, based on your, uh, you know, um, internal climate rather than, you know, just go aim for a very high score. Mm. Because it, you never, you know, I would say, because every time there's new economy evolving and emerging, and you can't, you know, really do anything to get a high score. But then you have to, you know, reveal your internal resources and what is your internal priorities. And so that you can have a, you know, more holistic plan mm -hmm. to how, uh, you know, advance your performance according to your own, you know, pace. pace. And for, for MTL, because last year we have uh, rolled out an ESG investment fund internally for ourselves to support the ESG related uh, projects. Because uh, we understand that if we need to, you know, improve our performance or even go for you know science based targets, we have to have lots of investment, you know, to help us to decarbonize or you know improve our performance. So we need to have some, you know, more criteria, uh, you know, just focus on ESG rather than you know, looking at the you know returns and you know in terms of your financial, you know, um, you know, performance. So that's why we have a new framework for ourselves to prioritize the resources. I think that's important, the first step that we you know, to, to help us to, you know, we look at what we are, we have to do in the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely don't chase the score because as we said, uh, CDP are constantly changing the questionnaire. And so with, <laughs> with, with ISSB coming in um, at less than eight months after uh, the, the final finalization of the, the draft, draft framework, um, uh, whether we maintain our main score um, uh, is, is, uh, up for debate. Uh, there's part of me that expects us to drop a little bit as a result of uh, of that coming in. So, so yeah, don't chase the score. That shouldn't be your driver. Use it as a guide around what the expectations are within the market. Thank you. So we, we actually have discussed a lot about data. So I think many companies find it quite challenging to obtain data from their supply chain partners. So can I can, can you share with us how you can uh, get your supply chain partners on board to support your climate actions? Mm, well, okay. Well, maybe I, well, I, I would say in general, we are looking at the ESG performance from a supplier rather than just, you know, in terms of carbon. And uh, I can share a little bit about what we did last year. And uh, last, uh, I think early last year, uh, we tried to have a, a survey among our top tier suppliers, see what are their performance about uh, ESG and also uh, the understanding about ESG so that we can, you know, work on the um, a plan for them to enhance the performance. And after you know, the, um, the, the survey, um, uh, when we looked at the results, uh, we find that, well, for you know, most of the um, suppliers, they have certain level of understanding of ESGs and they, well, they comply with the legislation and you know, they have established some of the uh, management systems to help them to improve their safety, environmental performance, safety performance, and so on. But then when we talk about carbon, well, some of them uh, replied that they have already done uh, well, some um, measures to um, reduce the carbon emissions, like uh, like using more energy uh, efficient appliances, uh, or you know, uh, replacing you know the LED lighting and so on. But when we talk about carbon accounting, most of them don't know how to do it, and perhaps well, they need some external help to do that, and so. Um, um, after you know reviewing all this um, you know results, and we start to engage them you know uh, first by you know um, talking more about what is carbon you know accounting and what are we expecting to do, and we try to have the first uh, you know um, 
awareness of, uh, seminar or you know sharing sessions with our suppliers last year to engage our top 50 you know um suppliers from our supply chain to talk more about that and this year we will continue our effort in you know educating them and uh, you know to let them know more about what are we expecting them and what are the international trend on covering this coast trip. So that's what we are starting to help them to, to understand and to learn more about that. So, so we we started off by doing a full scope three inventory. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've mapped out our full scope three across the group. And uh, what, what makes it slightly easy for us at the holding company level is is how that scope three is, is made up. Obviously at the individual operating company level, suppliers are, 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 are a significant source of emissions, but at the holding company level, actually 55% of our um, scope three emissions comes from our investments and principally our investment in Cathay Pacific. And so uh, Cathay Pacific discloses and has done for a very long time, it's scope one, scope two emissions. So we have ready, access, ready available access to 55% of our scope three emissions straight off the bat. And then the other, uh, 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 pushing 10% of our scope three emissions also comes from uh, the use of finished goods from our, from Taiku Motors, the, uh, the use of the cars, the trucks, the motorbikes that we're selling. And for there, obviously, we, we don't follow around all of our customers tracking their emissions. That's completely impractical. In that case, what uh, the use of proxy data, it, it, it makes sense in that sense. Um, from suppliers, I think, you know, uh, that's why Coca-Cola, they're doing direct engagement initially with the suppliers of packaging to actually determine uh, what the actual uh, um, uh, uh, scope three emissions are from the procurement of the, the PET, the HDP, the aluminium fans, et cetera. And, and so our properties are, done, are doing similar in relation to the steel, the concrete uh, and, and the glass. And so it's very, uh, um, uh, your approach will vary depending on the nature of where your scope three emissions are coming from. And, start off by doing a full mapping exercise of your scope three because uh, and also recognize again we talked about the fact that this is a journey there are there is readily available proxy data that you can use for your scope three emissions it's perfectly acceptable at this point um, to use proxy data and then start slowly and gradually engaging with your uh, tier uh, tier one suppliers on the basis of probably uh, uh, the, the size of contract that you have, the, the value of the contract, uh, and then start engaging with them and actually slowly start transitioning from the use of proxy data to the use of real data. Um, but proxy data is available. You can report on your scope three using it. Yes, uh, last year we started to get a, get a list of our critical suppliers who each year we purchase a certain amount of value of goods from them. And then we identified, uh, we did an assessment by ourselves about their sustainability risk. Uh, I think the outcome was last year, we have engaged about 20% of our purchase value of goods and services of suppliers uh, and then engaged them to, to do the common uh, accounting. But then it, it was a lot of effort, I must say. You have to provide the financial support uh, because we employed a consultant. You have to provide your expertise because we have members to coach them on the scope. Uh, how to set boundaries and what are the useful data for your company. And then it, it really spent some time, but it was all worth it. Uh, and then for, for, for the individual suppliers, apart from getting the data for your company, they also share the data. I mean, they can cut up another part of the data to the, another of their customers, which is kind of a win-win situation for both sides of us. Of us. So I think it is a, a, an important and meaningful step for both sides of the parties. Thank you. Just to be mindful of time, so may I know if uh, anyone got any questions from the floor that uh, before my, I ask my last question here? Anyone? So if you... Uh, you made a point regarding uh, renewable energy uh, in the Hong Kong, the 85%. Uh, that's 50%. Uh, but if you look, for example, at the EU, they are currently decided that, for example, nuclear and gas both agree. My question actually is, so, 
point of view, look at Swire as a global company. So, how do you deal with the different definitions of, of renewables and green? How do you incorporate that in your portfolio? So it's an interesting question. Uh, if, if if you don't mind, I'd almost rather bat it over to Ellen from CDP because ultimately uh, that, that's the definitions that we're using. So uh, you, you're 100% uh, right. You know how uh, whether it's renewable energy and how you define renewable energy, or is it low carbon energy, which could be very very different. So you know uh, hydropower uh, is is used extensively in mainland China. Is that renewable energy? Certainly low carbon energy. Um, and, and so the, how we align our, how we, the definitions that we use is in alignment with uh, the, the CGP server. Thank you. So to, okay. Okay, so to conclude this section, uh, I just want to ask uh, what will your company do further in this coming, say, uh, three to five years to not only getting a better score, but to make your disclosure more transparent and Again, more climate resilient. Um, I, maybe I start first. Uh, this year in 20 and 2023, we are actually kicking off a project to perform a physical risk assessment for tier one critical suppliers. So this will be our 2023 plan. You? Well, until actually we have developed our own roadmap for to decarbonize and to enhance our resilience. And then since we start getting you know, uh, submissions is a step, uh, we're now validating our target. Hopefully we will get um, you know, confirmed very soon. And also we have already started our border carbon you know, accounting and then uh, by you know, engaging a local university to help us to develop to, to you know, uh, measures our border carbon for new world developments. So, so it just will help us to enhance our border carbon disclosure in the future. Um, so, so for us, uh, um, in relation to the upcoming CDP submission, um, uh, the two two big new items. So, one, both of which I've sort of touched on. So, uh, one is the the rolling out of internal carbon pricing um, within our major operations. So, that will be um, discussed within our upcoming sustainability report published in April, as well as uh, the um, uh, upcoming CDP submission. The other is in relation to. Uh, scope three. So we've done this full scope three inventory, um, and we'll be disclosing uh, scope three representative of about eighty percent of our total scope three emissions in the the upcoming report. Uh, for future developments, uh, two two key things. So one is uh, the uh, addition of transitional risk into the scenario analysis piece, and we're working on a standardised uh, process for scenario analysis across the group, so that when we're reporting at a group level what the different um, uh, risks identified within each of the individual businesses. We're using the same scenarios, the same methodologies, so the board has a full understanding uh, of, of that risk piece. And, and the, the other um, is is, a, is is very similar to to, to what um, uh, we've just heard about from Jessica. Is that uh, we've um, in the process of developing our decarbonization transformation plan. So we have our 2030 target of a 50% reduction in scope one and scope two. We've committed to net zero by 2050. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll have uh, identified the actual pathway that we'll actually go through in order to make that transition from where we are now to the 50% reduction to the net zero, including scope three by, by 2050. Thank you. So this is the end of our section. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, here to Okay, one more. Okay. One. One, two. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
from the person and online participants. We will now start with our serial report. To begin with, may I invite Ms. Terry Ann, head of sustainable finance, commercial banking from Asian City, to share with us the role we have needed to communicate and manage climate change risks. Ms. Ann, please. Thank you. So uh, we work with corporates of various sizes day in, day out, and particularly um, a lot of our SME customer base. So I thought today I will share a little bit of what we are seeing when we work with these SMEs. Why are they interested in engaging in sustainability? Uh, why are some of them are starting um, to think about ESG disclosure? And also some of the challenge that they're facing and where banks can play a role to help SME onto this journey. So why sustainability matters? I think by now we're all familiar with the science behind climate change and the real urgency and need to take action. Um, but taking that aside, you know, businesses are really feeling a lot of pull and push factor to get them to embark on the sustainability journey. And particularly for SMEs, we see sort of three factors. The first is mainly from their buyers. Whether companies know it or not, Typically, a lot of the multinational end buyers, they actually have a scorecard that they measure their suppliers on. And a lot of times within those scorecards, there will be ESG elements. So some of our clients are starting to get questions, their buyers, asking them about topics related to ESG, um, perhaps things like labor conditions, perhaps things like um, some of the sustainability practices, even some of their emissions data, et cetera. And at the end of the day, a lot of the SMEs um, in Asia, in Hong Kong, in the Greater Bay Area, they are being assessed as to what, what they're doing um, in the ESG space. And these buyers would also screen out some of these suppliers if they are not performing against some of their standards that they're expecting from the suppliers. So that's one. Second is around regulations, especially for some of the SMEs who have uh, manufacturing um, interest, uh, say in a lot of the mainland Chinese cities. There are a lot of especially environmental and now more and more social related regulations that the government um, has launched um, over the past decade. And a lot of them are sort of catching up um, gradually. So definitely a regulatory uh, requirement there. And I think third is around the, the end buyer, the consumer side. I just want to share some of the statistics that we found in one of our reports. Right. Oh, as you can see, so 86% um, of, of uh, our, our, our clients are saying that they would expect a, an increase of revenues from sustainable um, activities. And also 24% of them um, have been looking at ESG-related metrics of their um, supply chain. So it is something very real um, for businesses. And we also, from various surveys, have validated that actual of end buyers or end consumers, they're willing to pay a premium to buy from a brand that is being more sustainable. So sustainability is now impacting the bottom line of a lot of SMEs. But what is sustainability? Well, it means different things to, to different um, companies, but typically it, re it revolves around the E, S, and the G. So E is environmental, so things like the, the natural resources use, um, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Social typically is around um, the, the employee health and safety, uh, uh, training, um, et cetera. And when it comes to governance, typically it's around support, diversity, business ethics, anti-barbary and corruption, et cetera. And it is also important for SMEs to understand what a sustainability means to them because it would inform what kind of ESG metrics they would like to measure um, and to, to report. So looking from uh, 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 at another survey that we did, again, speaking to the importance of our disclosure, it is interesting to see that 48% of the, the respondents of this particular survey around sustainable finance and investments say that there's inadequate disclosure uh, of, of ESG. Um, and two-fifths of the respondents say that there's a lack of talent to help 
the company embark into ESG journeys. I think it, this reflects um, a lot of uh, what um, the, 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 the issuers or companies that are facing in terms of challenges. We also did uh, an, an another um, survey or a research um, with the uh, e Economic Intelligence Unit. I just wanna share some of the findings. So the, what you see here on the screen are the 10 highest challenges that companies face uh, when they embark and onto their ESG journey. And this also informs us as banks, like where we can help most for, for the SMEs. So I'll highlight the four gaps that, that we see, and we also hear it the most from our clients that are in green. So first is the skills gap, which resonates uh, quite well with some of the other surveys that, that we, we, we have conducted. Engaging a broad spectrum of stakeholders, supply chain complexity, and also measuring and reporting on progress. And what we have done is particularly around these challenges, we have launched a number of initiatives to try to help close some of these gaps. And one of which obviously is supporting the, 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 the BEC and CDP capacity building program on disclosure. On the side, We've also launched our HSBC ESG Academy. So it is a series of free ESG training for SMEs. And we go into more fundamentals around things like you know, what is ESG, how to engage your stakeholders, who to engage, what are some of the tools for engagement. So again, pinpointing some of the challenges that our clients are telling us they're facing. And you know, feel free to scan the QR code here. We, we have um, a, a number of uh, a session, the next one is in a couple of weeks time. Um, and, and we do have a, a third party technical training partner to deliver these sessions. And, and we've also leveraged on other service providers in the market. So what you see here on screen is a partnership with a platform called Diginex, which basically makes ES reporting easier and cheaper for businesses, especially for SMEs. So traditionally, when a company engages in ESG reporting, they hire a consultant, pay quite a hefty sum of money, go through a, a long process um, to, to understand their company's position, to get the baseline, to measure the data, and then to produce an ESG report. Um, what Diginex provides is an AI-enabled system, whereby with a click of a few buttons, the system or the platform will prompt to you what are some of the potential areas you should look at and who are the potential stakeholders you should involve in um, to, to uh, compile and also to consider when it comes to ESG reporting. And it's also a digital platform where we don't need spreadsheets anymore. It's prompted uh, reminders to various stakeholders. Everyone can collaborate on the same platform. Everything is blockchain, um, tracked with proper audit trail, et cetera. So very, very tangible. Um, services that we can help with SMEs to enable them to do more slick um, ESG reporting. And it goes very hand in hand as well with the CDP um, Disclosure uh, Project because um, the platform is a collaborative platform. So when, when businesses collect some of these metrics, they can then export it into whatever format they can send it to their buyer, to their a supplier to their banks, etc. So um, it just makes the entire administrative process of, of ES reporting easier. And we we do um, see a number of companies, our private ones, um, thinking of starting doing ES reporting. And precisely it's because they want to share the good work that they've been doing with the community and um, potential investors and also with their banks. And increasingly various stakeholders of SMEs are increasingly looking at evidence of companies engaging in sustainable activities. And the best way to demonstrate it is through ESG reporting, where you can track your performance, demonstrate improvement, and also set longer term targets. So this is all I want to share. It's just a quick overview of what we're seeing um, when working with our clients on what are some of the challenges that they're facing and where we come in um, as a bank to hopefully help companies to do more disclosure. Thank you.
Thank you. So it's my pleasure being invited by BEC and CDP here to share with you guys um, a little bit more about the climate change questionnaires. Um, but I know that some of you guys may have already submitted your CDPs and so on that may not have started. So today we'll give a brief idea because we only have 15 minutes and uh, we, I'm happy to discuss with you more detail afterwards uh, if you have more, more detailed questions. So um, it's more, very important that uh, we work we work together with all the ecosystem parties like banks, we have regulators here, we have corporates here, we also have some academy here. So it's, it's CDP is helping the eco ecosystem to be to keep the tra information transparent, communicate with each other. Like CDP also have the supply chain functionality to help help our customer supply to communicate and share data. So today we will cover um, three parts. First part will be overview of the questionnaires. The second part will be some key changes, and the third part will be some tips and reminders. So um, I'm not going to repeat uh, what Alan have, have been introduced CDP. Um, so in, in the CDP, in, with our experience, um, the questionnaire has been changed year over year to improve the transparency and also the detail level, level of detail of the uh, information should gather. And uh, it's very important that uh, throughout the journey, engage your internal stakeholders, like just now uh, Mark or Jessica or Jasper also mentioned that, um, how do they get the data? How do they influence the in internal stakeholders? How to make them understand what's the importance of ESG or even CDP? Why do we need to get a such tremendous level of data? So it's very, very important to, to spare time to start the journey and also, it's also important that uh, for company, they should um, plan ahead to have a, a roadmap or have a um, have a, a um, action plan to get prepared for this. Um, all, all sort of different jargons that I mentioned: scope free, climate risk, all sort of things. In the questionnaires, there are generally fifteen sections and plus a supply chain session. The supply chain session session is not being scored. And you can see that some of the section like 13 and 14 will be very specific to certain industries. And in the, in the CDP um, structure, there are two types of questionnaire response. One type is full version and the other type is mini, minimum version. So you can see from the legend uh, next to each topic, some of the topic will be reduced the level of questionnaires and some of the topic will be re, um, uh, re, uh, excluded in the minimum version. So it's also a good starting point for company um, for just first time submissioner, you might consider the minimum version to get yourself prepared and understand how the CDP questionnaire works. And in each section, for example, in section one to four, um, it will be very aligned with TCFD, including the governance, uh, recent opportunities, business strategies, and the target and performance. In terms of what in the question it would be like, or oh, any, any uh, oversight on the climate issues, uh, what's the identification of the climate risk and opportunity process? What has been done uh, or what is planned to do in the company? Uh, how to address these risks and opportunities? And also, of course, the scope one, two, three uh, emission disclosure and also whether you have any targets. Targets doesn't mean only um, science based target, it also includes um, conventional, directional, or any numeric targets. And as Kelly mentioned this morning, quite a lot of company now is sticking with uh, qualitative targets and, and um, company can consider uh, in the future to move into a qualitative, quantitative target or even science-based target to improve the performance. And also CDP is also a platform to help company to track the performance, given that you, you in, include your uh, uh, scope one, two, three mission in the uh, response. And also in 567, we have covered a little bit on uh, scope one, two, or three emission data disclosure, as well as we should also consider what kind of baseline, which year of baseline we should consider as to compare uh, the performance in the future years. And also give a, um, a starting point to track the performance, whether the company is improving or uh, is, is uh, staying at the same level, all sorts of things. And uh, also in the questionnaire, you will suggest company to break down the emission by country, 
by subsidiary by business division in order to also help company to better track track the performance and the and the data. In terms of um, in terms of energy, it's very similar. Given we have emission, um, quite a number of emission will be derived from energy, including fossil fuel emission, also also electricity use, and as well as steam cooling. And these all will be considered scope one or two emission anyway, but also disclosing the actual usage consumption level. And some additional metrics which are important is also important to the company would be some sort of waste, um, land use uh, data, also any low tech, uh, low carbon technology uh, invest and investment. Because actually, if you think of waste, actually, or probably not scope one and two uh, emission, but waste, how to end up, how to treat your product end of life cycle, how to treat, or to treat the waste, it would be also part of the scope free emission. That's why uh, waste should be also a uh, part of the consideration. Um, so in, in our in our previous also, also talk about um, scope one two emission and scope three emission. Um, I will spend a little bit more time on scope three emission in case some of you may not be get may not familiarize with the jargons and all the details. I think scope one two most of you guys have been known already. And if you talk about scope three, uh, very commonly uh, we'll consider uh, the category one and two was purchase material and uh, capital goods in the company. For example, we give a few industry examples like garment company, uh, what kind of fabric you are using, uh, using polyester, are you using wool or using cotton? They all have different carbon intensity, carbon, yeah, body carbon there. As developer, many of us already know cement, steel, uh, or uh, some key high, high, high carbon and body component in the, in the material use. And for F&B company, uh, meat, for example, beef, many of us already know that uh, it's a higher, more, relative higher carbon intensity, also lamb versus pork and, and uh, um, poultry. Uh, so that's why there's, you, you can see that there are some F&B moving from beef to new meat. That's also one of the way that company try to decarbonize and also do it in different ways. Uh, waste that probably mentioned in the production end of life and also your packaging materials. Because when you sell the packaging material, you sell product with your packaging materials, actually most of the time, these packaging material will be go to the waste. Um, in order to reduce the waste generated, one of the ways is to recycle. If you have any recycle initiative, um, encourage your, your, your uh, customer to uh, recycle your products to your company. Uh, for example, we put example like, uh, if clothing company like H&M, Levi's, they all have um, different recycle program to encourage uh, their customer to bring back the, the, the clothing and into recycle and reproduce the products. And also transportation would be one of the key factors as well, because when you purchase your goods or when you deliver your goods, uh, you will involve upstream or even either downstream transportation or service provider. Uh, for FMB, we'll say like even delivery for, for Panda would be what, what you need to consider in the upstream if you order per products from overseas, whether you choose using air freight or ocean freight, uh, that's all your consideration as part of your carbon emission. So it's no longer only to consider uh, your own operation, like reduce our fuel use or reduce our electricity use. Scope three will be more broader, the scope and also involve your supply chain. And in the second part of the CDP questions, uh, it also involved uh, some some like verification. I think we have also covered this morning verification of uh, your scope one, two, and three emissions, as well as you may also get verify your energy consumption and waste also different parameter to to help to um, get more higher assure level and also get confidence to your reader uh, to the market understand your performance. And in terms of carbon pricing. Uh, internal carbon pricing, like Mark mentioned, how to how 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 the company internally uh, charging different department on the carbon uh, a carbon emission to encourage different carbon a different department to reduce the, the the carbon footprint. There's a way, and on the other hand, if you your company has operation in Europe or like in California, uh, some of or even in Singapore. Some of this con this country has already have their carbon emission scheme, so you will need to disclose in in this section about your activity in those areas. As well as if you got your company has been 
purchasing different type of carbon credit, you will be also uh, asked to disclose your activity level here. Um, in, in next session engagement, uh, it will cover how do you engage your supplier? How do you engage a different party in your business? Uh, how do you uh, assess uh, how your, uh, your, your supplier climate assessment? That all sorts of things will be covered in here. And in 13 and 14, there will be more uh, sector specific, like, like it would mainly focus on food, beverages, tobacco uh, industries, and or uh, financial industry because they have financial portfolio. And in 15, it's a relatively rather new topic recent days uh, because you, you guys may have already heard about TNFD, uh, the TCFD plus nature version, is if I simply saying it, uh, how company assess the biodiversity related issues. Um, was was action taken or sort of things, and I think Time Guess also recently released the climate action climate report that already piloting TNFD in their assessment, telling people uh, how how the diversity uh, affect the business, how they uh, mitigate or address these risks. And last but not least, uh, supply chain section like. What we said, like um, the customer may ask the supplier to fill in, and this this mainly focus on the emission and port level data to help the customer to understand the performance. So, uh, if we have already talked about the fifteen section of CDP questionnaires, uh, CDP also published their scoring methodology online. So here we just want to uh, elaborate a little more and letting you know how to read the. The, uh, the scoring map, I would say, because uh, in CDP, there is, um, I would say, dynamic questionnaire format. So if some of, some part of you have say yes, there will be additional question come up uh, to ask you. Uh, a reminder that that's why common problem when we talk about um, helping different kinds to submit the questionnaires. Sometimes they say yes, and then they miss the additional session, and then they submit it with blank response and they don't get score. And then they call CDP and ask them why, and then uh, it would take a longer time to help you to rectify the score. And, and therefore, here is just uh, um, to remind you guys that there are variable scoring routes um, based on your response. CDP may change the subsequent questions uh, to ask you some, for more information. Basically, if you saying that this question is about whether you have targets, right? So if you are, you're picking absolute target and you're Brought instead of intensity target, uh, you will get different question in the in the questionnaire, and also these question will also affect uh, how much score you, you can get. Also, the base of base score you you you, you could be award uh, that will be uh, part of the scoring uh, consideration. And in terms of CDP, just now in the break, I think some some of the uh, participants also asking uh, how, how does the score works? Uh, whether it's a D is a very best score. And this morning, I think other other speakers also shared that uh, there's a score in Hong Kong, the distribution. Um, I think CDP is not only we are chasing for high score as, as we discussed this morning, it's also encouraged the disclosure, uh, the, the, the level of disclosure and the start uh, getting start on your journey. So uh, in CDP, they, they move from D required like a disclosure level. If you move to C, it require uh, it, it, it achieve an awareness level. If a B is a management level and A leadership level, um, in each level they are they are a, a bucket of scores. Um, like uh, for if you move need to move from D to C minus, you know, get like uh, eighty percent or above score around. The disclosure requirement in order to move to C, even you, you achieve some of the C, B, or A questionnaire response. So this is the the the, the way to um, the, how how CDP are scored. And uh, this is a one page summary uh, in mirror to CDP uh, scoring. I think this is a, a quick summary that helping company to understand how do you get a higher maturity level of um, in ESG in different areas and also lower maturity. Uh, but it, it doesn't mean that you need to go for high maturity in year one, but it helps company to prioritize which area is your focus, which area you are going to put more um, um, resources and also effort on it. So for example, we have talked about some of them target um, scope one, two. Uh, also, for example, um, governance, uh, we have mentioned that TCFD also have governance sections. Uh, in order to have a starting point, um, probably nowadays, 
when your uh, SME or smaller company may not have a very robust design or uh, board structure or, or governance structure around sustainability, maybe you're doing a lot of things, but not having a formal uh, governance structure, then you can move towards to having board members and also uh, uh, board members who have a board member structure. And also as Jesper mentioned earlier, if you have a bad higher uh, expectation of the uh, um, governance structure, you probably have the ESG link remuneration plan on the management. So uh, this, this table summarizes uh, how the maturity spectrum works. And next we will talk about uh, a few key changes in 2023. There are uh, quite a number of 20-ish modification, uh, but we are focused on some new questions. Um, the new questions are quite straightforward uh, uh, to my understanding. Uh, the first change is like, um, the uh, CP will ask the company to break down your emission by subsidiary. That's the way to how to enhance the traceability tracking and uh, industry collaboration. CP would like to understand the company whether um, they have engaged, they have participated in different initiatives like RE100, UNC, DC, or TCFD, TNFD. That's how that's helped the investor to understand the commitment of the business. And last is biodiversity that we have already discussed. Um, so these are the key changes. And the last part will be some tips of responding. Uh, timeline that has been discussed this morning. Um, we have some suggested timeline that uh, company could should, should all um, start preparing or start thinking about whether you, you would want to submit the CDP questionnaire this year with, um, you know, CBC also have their program to sponsor different parties to engage in this exercise. And data collection and processing uh, will be take around, I would suggest to one to two months and other report response drafting. This time it's just illustrated to help you understand it could take few months or, or, or four to five months to get prepared. Just because most of the time you spend will be engaging your internal stakeholders, engaging your board, engaging your other departments. As a sustainability department, most common is like if you're a construction company, how to engage the engineering department, project department, or sales department to understand you are doing this. And they also have their business as you business uh, uh, routine process. So plan I have with them on a timeline will be help you to gather that more accurate and also uh, a more uh, smooth process on your data gathering. Also, in when you draft the response, you will come across different questions. Um, especially a first time submissioner. So you, you, you start early, you have but for time to, to get ready the process. Um, so the earlier you start, the better. And also if you go with CPC program or if you choose private response, the scoring will only for yourself and you know, it, it will not be public. So uh, don't worry about uh, you're getting a low score. And, and the last part will be the resources, uh, several other tips. CEP website has been very resourceful. They have reporting guidance, they have scoring methodology, they have a list of responses. All these a list of responses are public. So if you are interested to understand their response, what they are doing, how come they are getting higher scores, you can refer to their responses. Um, second part is to prepare ahead as said, uh, because uh, many of the inputs are backward looking. Um, Although we have climate forecast, um, for example, opportunity adaptation, TCFD is forward looking, but most of the data will be backward looking. Uh, it already happened. So if we are submission right now, we are submitting 2022 data. Um, if you prepare ahead, and also if this year you start with your response, you will identify gaps, just like gap analysis to allow you plan ahead for next year. So you have another six months time to improve the performance for next year's submission. Um, internal engagement will take time as said, and also uh, allow sufficient data, a uh, time to get the data from different parties. Uh, very important, the data definition, how do you get the data, where the department understand the consistent message, would affect the data consistency and whether you have a right data to submit. And also uh, understand or comprehend some best practice, understand the, the market uh, developments like assurance verifications, uh, TCFD, scope free, science-based target, or even carbon pricing, biodiversity. Also, uh, I think many speakers already talked about ISB will be uh, considered, will be factored in part of CDP response in 2024. Uh, this all will help you to understand uh, how to prepare your response and how to in, uh, improve the score 
going forward. So very important that in the first year, I think don't expect so high, don't aim for A at the very beginning. Uh, usually companies, uh, small medium companies maybe start with C or D. You have, you have already done a lot of things and this is your first year doing CDP, maybe B, B minus, uh, but don't expect too much. But I think enjoy the first year journey to understand the gap and then you can go through the enhancement and improvement time in the future. So um, since so a few publications that we have been collaborating with different parties in the market, uh, for example, EX, uh, we have helping, we have helped them to write some section on ESG, how to help companies to set up good corporate governance. Uh, in the middle is World Economic Forum, we also have some guidance framework, uh, helping company to start their ESG reporting, start gathering their data. And the right hand side will be more advanced if companies want to go through the net zero journey. Uh, we have collaborated with Microsoft have a nine building block program, helping companies step by step to uh, achieve net zero. And also if you go for net zero, also SBTI that I discussed this morning. Thank you everyone. Uh, I hope this session quickly 15 minute session help you understand a little bit more about CDP, but given the, the complex question, happy to discuss with you later on. Thank you. So now let's move on to the second kind of discussion regarding motivation and approach on climate disclosure. I invite the emerging map, candidate policy and research at BEC to moderate the kind of discussion and introduce our panelists. Please, Mr. Law. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's me again. Uh, <laughs> First, I would like to invite our panelists uh, to our stage. Uh, of course, we have Carrie, uh, who made a presentation to us just now. And then we have Tony Yip from Tony Yip uh, Green Architectures. And uh, we also have Gary Yao, uh, who's the manager uh, of the social impact and sustainability uh, section of the Harvard Business, uh, the Harvard School. Uh, Gary is uh, representing uh, Ravi, uh, his pet, uh, who's feeling sick today. So. Um, Rafi couldn't join us today. Uh, please first give us some energy by having a round. I agree to start with, uh, I think I have two points to add. Uh, first, uh, feel free to stay behind. I think the coffee would still start <laughs> after 5 p.m. for some networking. Uh, and secondly, uh, I, I did not mention in my presentation, uh, we actually talked to some of the SMEs just now. Uh, we target to deliver some Cantonese sections later uh, to SMB specific uh, companies to engage them more directly. So please uh, take the message from us and, and we'll come back on this. Uh, so, so back to this panel, uh, the differentiation. Um, the differentiation is um, the first part, we, we talk more about the large corporates and their perspective, uh, as well as uh, how they see the supply chain engagement. But this section, we actually look more into uh, first time uh, disclosing party, uh, maybe first at primary user experience and, and they can speak from another angle of perspective. Uh, to start with, I actually want to pass the floor to uh, maybe Tony first uh, and then Gary to, to have a few minutes. Tell us your journey in four minutes, uh, wow. each of you. Four and minutes. then we'll, we'll come back to our, our discussion. Uh, maybe Tony. Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, my journey to um, to get the CDP uh, last year, um, actually there are two driving forces to do so. Uh, first of all, I'm an architect. I'm not a sustainability professional. So, and and I I I found my um, my architectural firm um, back to two o one seven, and uh, there are two driving forces. The first one is. Um, Three years ago, we participated, we signed up the uh, BEC uh, low carbon charter. And last year, because the question there turned into the CDP, uh, and that really introduced that is the disclosure program. And then we look into that. The second driving force for me is I started my own firm, uh, Tony Green Architects. Actually, the vision of my firm is to drive um, sustainable design. We hope that all the architectural projects, urban design projects, even, even interior design projects should have the strong vision on environmental and social sustainability. And after five years, just last year, I really hope that um, not just 
um, the building, we know how to design the low carbon building, but how can we walk our talk, our own practice, even our design for some corporate or some end user, they also care about the carbon, such that we do two things. One is we issue our first sustainability report. Okay, I have to declare that uh, we are really a small, we, small SME <laughs> because we have not more than 20 staff. So uh, uh, we, I, I, I actually, I did the whole sustainability report. And because of that, I have to learn two things. One is how to reporting. And I see for the course, uh, the GRI, um, sustainable reporting and get the GRI uh, certified as sustainable sustainability professional. So that can help me to do all the reporting, understand the language, because I train as the architect, not really um, in such way to present the, the reporting. The second thing I need to really understand more about carbon, even though I, 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 I'm so fortunate, I did this first zero carbon project in Hong Kong 10 years ago, but that only on the project side, not the corporate. So I also um, attend the course the, um, and got the um, certified carbon auditor, understand really the language about scope one, two, and three. And that really helped me to do the sustainability report. And that made it much more easier for complete the questionnaire of the, um, the CPP. Of course, because um, my firm is a small firm, so some indicators I cannot achieve and I don't have resources in terms of the money and also manpower. I don't have the team, so I, uh, but that would be very good because the team is me. <laughs> and, and, and I need not to report to the board because I, I can drive all the things. So I get all the data on hand because I pay the electricity bill, I pay the salary, I establish all the company, uh, the, 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 uh, all the, uh, all the initiatives, of course, because we are the green architect firm at the very beginning, five years ago, already set some rules for the office, green office initiatives. So uh, even we have this program or uh, we promote more carbon disclosure, our colleagues also very res uh, responsive and take very good feedback on that. So that's why this is the first journey. But I've said that uh, maybe later on, I will share more about uh, there's uh, some difficulty uh, as an SME to maintain or to set the target because of the resources and also um, lack of some data uh, in filling uh, some indicators. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, maybe Gary, you can, you can start. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, so, yeah, my name is Gary. I am uh, the Harbor School. So just for everyone to know, actually, we are an international school. We are a kind of a small size international school, currently have two campuses on the Southern District. Um, so actually, like when, when you think about like, like ESG, like I think schools may not be the first comes into mind, definitely. It's like, uh, like kind of an underserved industry, in my, in my opinion, like when every other industry is moving forward and then schools are trying to catch up. Um, I think like our school uh, is very fortunate because our uh, founder, Dr. Jada Splurton, is uh, already uh, have the, the mindset of sustainability from the very first. So we have a marine science program in our school. So we have a marine science center. We have, uh, we have a Black Dolphin, which is a boat that we let our students and teachers to learn uh, in the sea. So uh, which is, uh, we are very glad to win an award uh, before in the International School Award. But I think everything starts two years ago in 2021 when we uh, when we're doing a lot of community service work. Then we we start to think about oh like the so, so, uh, the seventeenth SDGs that also include the environmental side. So we decide to launch a program called Social Impact and Sustainability Program. So it's like a sustainability program in a large corp, I guess. And then so we 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 have a team of two. So we uh, actually I'm uh, on a part time uh, or uh, you could call a volunteer uh, because I'm more on the administration side. But I uh, work with them to help uh, this uh, social impact sustainability program work. So um, also like, just like what Tony mentioned earlier, we are also trying to plan, we already have a plan to create a GRI reference sustainability report. So when BEC uh, invite us to 
do the CDB reporting as a first time report uh, reporter. So we are very glad to accept because we feel like this will align with our goals as well. And then we can also learn uh, as a learn all this new knowledge, just like what Tony said, like the team has to, uh, we only have an internal team. We did not rely on consultancy at the very, at, at this, at the, as of now. So we, we learn, like the team learn, like Rafi learn about it. And then we create the sustainability report. And also the CDP really gives us a lot of thought provoking uh, ideas. And then we, uh, but uh, a little bit different from Tony is we have to uh, report to the board we have uh, management to report to. So uh, this actually adds, uh, um, I think like a uh, complexity in, in, I think like with uh, like a lot of SMEs, like if you are a, a team, you have to reach out to management and board. Uh, I think there also requires some strategies, I guess. But I think uh, uh, what uh, today is like, I hope like we could like, for, for, from our perspective, we can give some practical experience and we can also share some thoughts to the SMEs here on how to proceed with the CDP reporting. Thank you, thank you, Kerry. Uh, maybe then I, I start with the questions and then uh, get um, uh, Kerry to comment after I ask the first question. Um, actually, we, we talk about disclosure today, right? After your experience, do you think such kind of assessment and disclosure actually enhance your business opportunities or like any requirements or perspective when you interact with any of your potential buyers or customers or otherwise, do you see as some risk? Like maybe first time you touch upon this, right? Do you see any relevance to your business impact and opportunities? Either one can, can start with. Okay, um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm, very good question. I um I do the sustainability report uh, even for participating CDP program, even the LBC is uh, just initiated by our own. It's not because of our client need this kinds of in incentive or initiatives. Um, even I got this. Um, there's no really direct link to the 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 immediate business. Of course, um, that can really help us that to promote our service in terms of the environmental sustainability as well. So such that, uh, um, honestly, uh, we, we still get the job from BZ. <laughs> so perhaps that really uh, can align with if the corporate really care about the sustainability we are doing on the same track. But what I am planning to is not uh, planning for the immediate need. We are really believe that maybe five and 10 years climate change, um, environmental sustainability, we become the um, mainstreaming that will be us. Uh, we have to do so. We, have, we, we, we cannot just to um, optional. Right now, what in our building industry is, if that project has, has certain budget, that is the environmental driven project. If that is not, okay, that's give it, or that's just get several features. But what I believe that it should be totally integrated, no matter how you have to um, uh, incorporate other green or sustainability elements in that. But by doing so, we have to benchmarking, we have to measure it. That's why the carbon auditing, that is a very important. And after auditing, you have to disclose. That's why this program can really help. So what we are doing is we, we can't tell because I, we, got, we, get, we get this, we, we, we have more business about that. But what I'm looking for is five or 10 years. And on the other hand, I think as an architect, as a building professional, this is our responsibility. Because you, you all understand that in Hong Kong, the carbon footprint, the building um, occupy two thirds of the carbon emission. And as the designer, we, we have the privilege to specify all the building materials and even the construction method that really contribute a lot to embody carbon and even the operating carbon. That's why um, I, I really want to say that uh, to learn this kinds of the method or carbon reporting, it should go back when I, uh, in the school, that should be one of the necessary curriculum. Everyone do every design. They, they should have this mindset. It's not just, uh, in terms of the aesthetics, in terms of function, but also in terms of the carbon, and that related to not local and global, the impact. 
So yeah, go back to your question, um, yes or no. We are not planning for immediate pieces, but we think that maybe five or 10 years, that will be um, a must to get this disclosure. Thank you, thank you, Tony. I think that, that also connects you, your architect firm, right? Uh, focusing on green architecture and, and that brings you so the story could be a little bit different from, from Gary, your school perspective. How, how does it relate to actually, students? Or how, how I think it's similar to Tony. Actually, there's a calling, I guess. Like, uh, I think if sustainability will be a, uh, a trend, it's an unstoppable trend, and it will be with us for many, many years to come. So we in the education sector, we believe that we should actually let the kids to learn, uh, to have the mindset. Um, I, I on on a more like uh, collaborative way, like working with other uh, like uh, not only like working between schools, but also with the private sectors or other NGOs as well to let the next generation to understand the climate change and also climate action. So climate disclosure is definitely one like one thing that is an important component. And I agree with Tony that we should actually like. In, I invite our secondary students or secondary schools to 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 learn more about this. And and actually, we know that already there are quite a number of uh, organizations, actually including BEC also, is working with schools uh, to to uh, help with the Beam Plus. I guess like there's one of the programs. So I think it's uh, I think the trend is there. And but uh, circle back to the to the question about opportunity. I think uh, aside like I think school is a really uh, different setup. So. You, we also have to take a, take care of the education side aside from the operation side. So uh, I think it's a calling. So I think we we also want to embrace that. And also at one point also secure buy in from not only from our management but also uh, not only our students but also uh, our parents. Like they are also playing a part of important role in our next generation. So also our teachers they are at the front line of uh, really like reaching out to the kids. That's why we also embracing the education for sustainable development concept as well. Thank you, thank you, Carrie. So Carrie, you, you speak to many SMEs, right? So uh, apart from your presentation, how, how do you see the connection of this disclosure and to the SME actual daily business and what's your perspective and offering? Sure. Uh, I think for certain industries, um, especially in the manufacturing and particularly in textile environments, we have seen clients who have benefited from having more orders because, for example, they are doing uh, more sourcing of sustainable yarn, etc. So for certain industries, um, we are seeing very tangible impact on, on the bottom line. And what we hear from a lot of clients as they go through the collection of data and then eventually reporting, it's very much a self-discovery journey. They start to realize how much they're spending on what, and that gives them some idea as to where they feel they can achieve savings. Um, and it, it's this journey, you know, as, as what you know, Tony mentioned. On day one, you're very much doing stock take, and then as the trend comes out after you report or you measure for a few years, you start to understand where are the cost drivers. So we have seen some of our clients also very, being very deliberate um, in understanding how does energy use, as an example, impact their cost base and hence what kind of changes they can make internally um, to, to reduce their cost. And then thirdly, from a financing perspective, actually having some of these ESG metrics also enables companies, including SMEs, to access sustainable finance. So in sustainable finance, there are certain uh, lending that we do that is related to sustainability performance. And depending on whether you meet certain sustainability performance targets, companies will be able to benefit from reduction in interest margins. So for certain clients who require bank financing and they have the ability to obtain a sustainability linked loan because they have been measuring and reporting some of these metrics, Assuming that they continue to do all the good work and they're able to meet the targets, they actually can benefit um, again tangibly uh, from a reduced interest rate as well. So, can they just submit you a CDP question there? <laughs> yes, so some of the data in there definitely can help. Um, 
as I alluded to earlier in my presentation, you know, ESG does mean different things to different companies. So even if all the companies measure the same set of metrics, we need to evaluate you know, what kind of metrics is material and relevant to that particular industry, to that particular company. So I would say having a, a CDP um, disclosure is definitely uh, will facilitate the process. Great. Um, maybe then I actually turn come back to the question where we speak about something good. Oh, okay, we should start doing this. Start from zero and and start doing. The question is like from from Tony, from Gary, your your practical experience, the resources, like how much time you take to to try this uh, disclosure journey. Mark mentioned he has a whole team uh, from from March to July to get through the process. So when you get notified about the opportunity, not, not necessarily the CDP, but uh, actually your sustainability reporting and disclosure, tell, tell us a little bit about the resources and time you need for, for this. Or maybe Gary first. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I think like the, the mem as previously, actually we also joined BC webinar last time. Uh, we also like uh, emphasize that the, we, the, I think manpower will be what SMEs are facing is challenging because uh, not only on the technical side, like we need to learn and then we, we should have a top uh, down approach that the management has to really support this initiative and to encourage and motivate the staff to do this because it will take additional time from the staff to do to do this or you you need like more resources to hire another person to handle this so i think um uh for us it takes actually for sustainability report we actually take like six months to one year to plan but actually the cdp we uh, we are very lucky because we already planning on sustainability reports. So when we receive the CDP, we can actually like, um, I mean, some of the questions are new to us and we need more time to reach out to our uh, management. But uh, I think like uh, we took us, I think two full-time staff, I think around uh, one week to two weeks to really consolidate all the information and to complete this CDP questionnaire. And uh, to be honest, like uh, it's really not perfect for our, questionnaire but uh we, we have some parts that uh we don't like we did not achieve but we 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 are very transparent we just mentioned in the data we mentioned we we have uh put our explanation why we have not done it so i think uh, at the end is uh like be transparent just uh don't like it's okay to be not perfect for the first time just make mistakes so, yes, I agree. Okay, for the not perfect at the first one. So I take this as the principle for me because I, I, I just told I did it by myself. So you like to have to study the MSc Master of Science. That's a degree for nine months. First of all, you have to learn what they are talking about. So I, I attend the course about the GRI reporting and carbon auditing. That may spend three or six months to get all the things and really to collect the data and convert those data uh, for the input. It may take around three months just by myself. But I, I, I think I can encourage the apps and SME that because, because of the size of apps ME, so it's not too difficult to collect all the data. And, 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 and the principle is at first, it's not perfect, it's okay. So, um, it's just because all the data on hand, how to convert it. The most challenging part is how to set the path, uh, how to project uh, in the coming five or 10 years. Really, you want to achieve the zero carbon target. Uh, last year, I, my original plan uh, was very aggressive. I really want to participate in SVTI because they also have the SME target, but I failed to do so because I found that I didn't have sufficient resources, especially for the verification part. They have to engage the third party to engage to verify. I don't have the resources to do so. Um, and, and the other difficulty, I think it's not the time to spend on that, is because as an SME, um, our, our, our change may be uh, quite fluctuating in terms of the staff, because we have uh, not more than 20 staff, but if I have the big project, we will engage more employee. May, and even our office premises, every two years, maybe we have to get a new one because of the expand of our office. And that will change the whole formula to calculate the carbon. 
even you already said that you want to reduce certain percent of the carbon because of change of the your office size, change of number of the staff, that also make the pen, uh, maybe you have to uh, adjust in a significant way. So that maybe compare with the big corporate already have the very clear roadmap for, for the development in terms of the SME, that also another factor you have to consider. But um, I think we all believe that um, it's not perfect, it's okay. You have to click start first and then you have the better understanding. It's not difficult to do so. You all have the data here. And as a boss, it really helps you to monitor the resources, um, the climate risk. Even you can engage your employee and they are also very eager to do so. They also learn to uh, how to um, operate the office in a more sustainable way. They also have their learning about that. So, so let's click start. Yeah, would be a very quick follow up. I think both of you did it uh, in house. You you did not get external consultant, right? So how how did it work? You did it learning by doing, or actually you you attend some webinars like this, or any any sharing, quick quick sharing on this. Yeah, actually, like uh, previously, I also talked to Merlin. Actually, like the first time CDP reporting is not. I mean, it's just the kickstart. But actually, how about the after, like after the CDB reporting, what should you do? So I think uh, I, I would like at, at, I finished my first year, but at this moment, I actually would like to recommend like to the first time reporter to like uh, think deeper and plan longer. I mean, like plan uh, further. So I think like, uh, I think BEC in the long run will be also trying to support after the first time CDB reporting, uh, might be more webinars or more uh, support on, on how to improve the scoring, but also the um, the SMEs could also like set aside a budget or or just like actually Merlin mentioned, uh, our our team does not have uh, external consultancies, but actually at this moment, like when we are trying to improvise, then we realize we actually need external external consultancies. Then at this time, then actually when you are doing the first. Uh, CDB reporting, you can start thinking ahead already and then set aside budget, set aside uh, the timeline, uh, the resources, then I think it will be more efficient. Harry, uh, any any thought on the resource gap uh, on what they mentioned? Yes, uh, completely echo it. This is the number one uh, feedback from our client when we don't have the resources or the capacity to do so. And, and hence, some of the services that I mentioned earlier, um, trying to provide those resources, be it free ESG training, be it um, partners with sort of digital platforms that help make uh, the process easier. Um, and, and I think as a bank, you know, keep giving us feedback on what you feel would be helpful for, for you as a journey. You know, we're very keen to support the SME community um, in everything sustainability related. So we're more than happy to continue to explore some of these partnerships and also services that we can offer. Hey, um, maybe I take a pause here. Want to see on site anyone wants to ask a particular question? Anyone? Yes, two from HSBC. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tony. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm actually very interested in what you mentioned about using the insights to actually help your clients. Uh, can you elaborate more about you what know, kind of yeah insights you get from going through the disclosure journey and how it can further support the perhaps the developers or the real estate companies? Okay, um, I, I I think um ultimately because um like for the um SVTI if architectural firm architectural practice uh, for design the building. And it's part of the scope three category. So uh, it's a very important for me um, to, uh, first of all, our own practice have to be disclosed. And then how can we gather the material, especially, and in terms of the embodied carbons, in terms of our uh, architectural design, how can we keep it low carbon, even advancing that zero carbon? So um, um, right now is the starting point. And then we build up our own inventory, uh, especially for the suppliers. And the, and the second thing is uh, we, because of that, we also gear up with 
another sub consultant. You know, for the building professional, we are just an architect. We need our engineers, surveyor, landscape architect. We hope that we can also influence them, try to um, in their practice becomes carbon disclosure or low carbon in our project, um, involving more carbon auditing and develop more uh, low and body carbon um, design initiatives. And, and I hope that because we have that specialty in our proposal, design proposal to the developers, and we hope that we can convince them. And then that becomes the, the change for our uh, where our supply chain. So this is what uh, um, my path uh, in the coming years, and and I can feedback what the uh, how I learned from uh, the CVP discourse. I think one of the key uh, I, I learned all the things from the webinars on the web, uh, uh, the distant learning course. But more important is I get several good case studies in the same field. So somehow in UK and US, the architectural firms, especially for those really with the strong vision of environmental sustainability, they already did very good on the carbon disclosure. Some of them already uh, ratified uh, with the SVTI. So I learned from their um, sustainability report, from their reporting, and see whether I can, I can adjust in our Hong Kong context. So, Hope that I can be maybe I, I maybe can drive the small architectural practice can also have the same impact on the sustainability. Okay. I have two questions. One for for Gary, one for Tony. The question for Gary is: the school are the students passionate about climate change and the carbon uh, reduction? Yes, they uh, are. That's one question for Tony. And the, uh, another question for Tony. What's really, you mentioned the driver, like you can mention about BEC's low carbon charter, you sign up, and this BEC, the CDP uh, questionnaire, uh, helping you to structure it. But what is the real driver? Because as an SME owner, what's in it for you, as such a small company, to commit to, even ambitious not to commit to FDI, which is a lot, a lot of company is still hesitating to commit to. So what is really driving is it your personal passion about climate change or you see that the uh, big uh, architecture companies are doing this and they're trying to 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 uh, more. what is the real driver so. okay um i'll go first i yeah definitely we our students when they are in the young age uh they for example, for our grade five students, they are relatively young. They have a global issues conference. So most of them choose climate change as the topic. And then actually like it's so overwhelming, we have to try to guide them like, oh, actually there are other SDGs like uh, on the social side, like do you want to uh, go for that as a topic instead? But I think, yeah, the, the, I think it's very, uh, I think the next generation is very aware of climate change. And then I think like uh, for when they get more mature, I mean, before, I mean, uh, in, before they enter to a college, we can definitely let them know that there's a, a whole industry, a new career that might be fitting for them, which is the sustainability reporting on the on the consultancy side. And um, we actually invited a, a few, like before we invited Carbon Base to visit uh, our, our uh, high school students and teach like some very basic concepts. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. It's really a big question. <laughs> I think this is my personal vision. I really believe that as an architect, we really need to be responsible to our environment. We really need to design for human, design for nature, design for human with nature. So that is our inborn responsibility. I really believe that. And before I set my own firm five years ago, I worked in um, two big architectural firms for more than 12 years. And actually before I studied architecture, my first degree was in environmental engineering. Almost more than 20 something years, I still look young, but I'm not. <laughs> At that time, I were already told that we really be responsible for our planet. Otherwise, there's a, that sustainability is not, for our second generation is for, for us. 
So I also have a very strong impact when they, uh, in 2004, at that time I visited Curitiba, one of the most sustainable city in Brazil. After that visit, I found that why in Hong Kong we are so resourceful, why we can't take responsibility at the upfront. And that's why um, I really so fortunate. I got the chance to design the first zero carbon building, you know, a previous firm and work in several green projects. And I really found that if I set up my own firm, my, the name of the firm already green architect, and I hope all the clients come to my office already have the vision in their, in their brief that this is, should be environmentally driven project. And, and that's why I also need to drive my own practice on the same track. That's why um, to follow the carbon auditing, the CDP, even for the SBTI. And I also find that I, I study um, and other firms and other architectural firms, design firms overseas, they can still do, do so. They can still can acquire such um, initiatives. Why Hong Kong cannot? We are so international or our, our background, we have such skill set. That's why I really hope that maybe I, I can really tell that to run, to start, to, to have the startup, to run an FSME really difficult in terms of all the resources. But this is what I believe. And yeah, so all the driven by own vision. <laughs> Um, maybe just take a last question, right? Uh, very last. We, we talk about the need. You are all pioneering, and SM and, and and carry. You are supporting the SME. We, we mentioned the need of transparency and do more disclosure on this. So one last word from you guys. Uh, maybe thirty second, one minute. How do you think you can motivate more companies to join the journey in this field? Like one suggestion. If I start first, I think. Oh, I think what Tony said, case studies we can bring more SMEs like Tony and Gary to tell the story. Then I think more SMEs will start to resonate and, 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 and start the disclosure as well. Yeah, I, I think we already mentioned, let's start. <laughs> it's not perfect, it's okay. So if you start, you learn um, what uh, the, uh, the information really what to get, it's not difficult but is you need not to target the perfect goal. And if you don't start maybe two or five years, you, you haven't started. So let's start first. Um, for me, like I, I just also want to share that like uh, we recently joined the Alliance of Sustainable Schools. And then I, uh, I think they have one, one model, which is I think it might also work for the SMEs is like, so in what in the Alliance, they actually have two things that require us to do for the school members. First, like you have to hold the management accountable, uh, the management and the board accountable of the actions done in the schools. Second is uh, we have to, each school member has to mandate to disclose uh, who are the major suppliers in, I mean, from uh, our value chain is not that complicated, but they, uh, we are required to re-mandate to show the name and, and of those suppliers. And then at one point, like we hope that, I mean, the founder hopes that the, the collaborative efforts can help change the whole supply chain in the school ecosystem, that uh, the suppliers has to be more environmental conscious and also providing data or um, for, for the schools to uh, change. So I think like also SMEs is so many of them, right? So is there a chance that it could be a more collaborative effort like between the SMEs and uh, maybe the associations could be the one who guide to, to lead. And of course, BEC could be the one who lead also uh, like each sector, how can they uh, achieve? Thank you. I think we can just give our panelists a round. Yes, we turn on the stage and stand up for a group of people, and they also invite you to the page. So, last but good. One more. One more. 
Okay, one more. Okay, but I mean, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I would try to be brief. Uh, thank you for staying until five. Again, uh, you have coffee and food outside. Um, I, I actually want to echo just now one thing. Uh, I mean, this closer already clicked in. Uh, Kerry also mentioned a perspective about uh, potential sustainable finance or future financing, they must be asking the questions. So for SME to potentially uh, compete, expand or even survive, uh, it seems an unavoidable question. The question is whether now, one year later or five years later. So, so that gives a big picture why uh, BEC and also this uh, carbon disclosure program, we want to make uh, our companies and signatories uh, understand the importance of these closures and where the gap uh, lies. I hope uh, today's our discussions can help you uh, understand a little bit more on this. Um, maybe going back to, to the bigger picture, I, I mentioned in the beginning uh, about the uh, NEPSIO carbon charter and also the carbon disclosure program. Uh, I think it's of BEC's interest to mobilize uh, as many companies as Hong Kong to join us because we want to foster such a uh, business ecosystem on the climate and environment topic to, 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 to deliver something like today that we uh, want to mention, not just on climate disclosure, but potentially just now uh, we mentioned about uh, target setting, uh, SPTI, the types of different actions as well as um, very importantly, from our perspective, uh, if our business sector have a collective vision, we can drive counter drive back the policy making process in the government. Um, so last but not least, uh, I really encourage you to sign up to our rebranded net zero carbon charter, uh, as well as for those relevant um, join the carbon disclosure program. And um, I want to thank uh, HSBC for supporting this. Thanks, uh, CTP, for being our technical partner. And of, of course, our audience here are online and uh, on site and also online. Uh, with that, I, I will just cl close today's session. And please feel free to come back to BEC and ask any of the questions. Now, please continue uh, enjoy your coffee, talk about the topics that we uh, have not finished just now. Thank you. <laughs>